Hey, hey, good morning. Scott Luton, Greg White with you here on The Buzz. Greg White, how are you doing today? I'm doing quite well. Yeah? Yeah. So uh, today is my father's birthday. He's the hugest KU fan, <laughs> and he's going to get a personal message from head coach Bill Self. And I just previewed it just uh, a few minutes ago. So uh, there won't be a dry in the house, I can tell you that. That is outstanding, man. What a great gift. Yeah. Yeah. My sister pulled that off. So, <laughs> so, uh, hopefully y'all had a great weekend. Uh, you need, you need to videotape him getting the message and share it with us. That'd be, wow. that'd be one. Nobody's going to be there, oh. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. Next year. Next yeah. Year. Well, I might, uh, video, I might send the message. I have the message. So maybe I'll post Let's that somewhere. Let's do that. So, but for today here at Supply Chain Buzz, where we every week, Monday, 12 noon, we tackle some of the biggest stories and developments across the world of global supply chain. And it's no different here today. Um, however, the content's no different. However, this is Supply Chain Buzz Takeover Day from our friends at Verison and Georgia Pacific. We have got an outstanding conversation yeah. teed up, don't we, Greg? Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, and, we did just barely avert a complete takeover. So, <laughs> great episode, didn't we? Hey, you, hey, all in good fun for sure. All yeah. in good fun. But, but you know, we've got a, a really interesting conversation. We're going to, of course, talk about the vaccine distribution. We're going to talk about sustainable packaging. We're going to talk about um, anti-fragile supply chains. I love that that phrase. Um, so, stay tuned. Uh, and, you know, quick programming note, if you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to find us wherever you get your podcast. Search for Supply Chain Now and subscribe for free so you don't miss conversations just like this. But Greg, let's say hello to a few folks before we welcome in the team here. Yeah. Let's say hello. We've got uh, oh, yeah. Marina uh, is back with us. If you remember, she was part of the outstanding Vets to Industry team. Uh, um, yes, of course. How could you forget Marina? You, you can't. She unforgettable, like Nat King Cole saying. Uh, great. Really enjoyed the episode and hope this finds you well. Great to have you as part of our live stream there, uh, Marina. Man, a lot of folks, they're ready to get going on this Monday. Mike Aver is back. He's always back. Content King. He's got a great hot take for everything. Aaron Peterson. Hey, Aaron, hope this finds you well uh, at Morgan State University where he'll be yeah. graduating up. Uh, with a supply chain degree. Uh, great to have you, Daria. And Daria's been bringing it on LinkedIn here lately, hasn't he, Greg? Yeah, no doubt. Some great insights there. Absolutely. Great to have you on the live stream, Daria. Gary Smith. It's a really quick sidebar. Gary, longtime friend, great big friend of the show, uh, supply chain keynote uh, back when we could do in-person events, right? But Gary stepped in on our This Week in Business History podcast and shared some things that you probably don't know about the Wright brothers. So look for that wherever you mm. get your podcast. Gary, great job there. That could be a long list for me. I know they owned a bicycle shop. <laughs> yes. Hey, man, you know everything, Greg. All right. So, so Albert, hope this finds you well. Great to have you here uh, via LinkedIn. Pierre, great to have you back. Go forth and buzz. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. Oh, boy. How do you say that in French, Pierre? Jeff Miller is back with us. Jeff, thanks so much for joining us. Supply chain is the business and hope this finds you well. All right. So we have got a uh, chock full conversation here today. Uh, Greg, are you ready to get started? Let's do this thing. All right. So we want to welcome in our esteemed panel here today. We got Paul Noble, founder and CEO at Verison, Letty Barrett, senior business analyst, also with Verison, and our dear friend, Mary Kate Love, operations business integration lead with Georgia Pacific. And founder of National Supply Chain Day. That's right. <laughs> One, Let's two, go. three. We are a rich company here. <laughs> Good We're here. afternoon. Legendary. Gang. So, Greg, I want to pick up where you left off right before we swooshed because uh, all three are dear friends. But the last time, I think one, one of the last times we collaborated, with Mary Kate, she was, she had just coined and founded <laughs> National Supply Chain Day. And we had a gangbuster conversation, fast yeah, moving conversation. Fantastic. It was that moving was so, so fast. Fun. 
it was moving so fast that um, I got kicked out of the stream. If y'all remember that. <laughs> oh gosh, was that when we had to fly solo, MK? I forgot. I'll never forget it. I'll never. We just kind of looked at each other and we're like, "Yeah, we got this." <laughs> hey, I'll say as a watcher and a viewer, I didn't notice a difference. Good. You guys did a great job. Wow, <laughs> resilient, I, I, resilient. <laughs> I agree with you, Lenny. Man, I try to forget those <laughs> moments, but yeah, that's yeah. right. That... All right, so uh, folks, I hope y'all brought your work boots here today. We got a ton of stuff to get through, um, and really, I'm glad that each of y'all could make time off your busy schedule to join us here yeah. on the bus. So, Paul, Letty, and Mary, uh, and Mary Kate, and Greg, we're going to start with what everybody is talking about, whether you're in supply chain or, or anything else any other aspect of global business and that is what we're referring to as the noble mission right the vaccine distribution that is that kicked off really got ramped up uh hit a new phase over the weekend and certainly today you know time magazine uh is weighing in talking about how uh the distribution has begun right and first shipments arriving here today supply chain dive of course one of our favorite sources for supply chain uh, content how the supply chain has been preparing for this moment. Love that by our friend, Matt Leonard. And the Wall Street Journal, of course, with just some great supply chain reporting, uh, talks about also uh, as the pandemic continues to surge across the US, hey, here's good news. Uh, hospitals are gearing up and that vaccine has begun to be shipped. So let's get down into uh, the weeds a little bit here. Let's talk about what's really kind of maybe taking place behind the headlines when it comes to the vaccine. Paul, let's start with you. Uh, good morning, and, and tell us tell us some things we should be maybe tracking here uh, across global supply chain. Yeah, thanks, everyone. I think it was the uh, first time I met Greg was on a uh, podcast with uh, Mary Kate and I. There we um, go. So That's throwing right. it back. Throwing yeah, I love back. that full circle. That was uh, the yeah. Bank of America building, right? Yeah. We were at Flexport. Yeah, that at right? Flexport. I got a parking ticket that day, actually. Did you really? <laughs> Just a reminder. Did you yeah. Charge it back to Scott. I should have. <laughs> Let me see if I can still do that. <laughs> and Greg gave me a ride back to the office because it was raining. That's right, yep. gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so no one to derail our conversation. Now it's been really exciting to watch um, the mobilization of you know this all the different parties from public to private and uh, nothing short of miraculous being able to not only spin the vaccine up in record, record time, um, but giving everyone exposure to the, you know, what's necessary to get, um, get things produced and from point A to point Z really, because it's going to so many different places. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Again, I, I, we've talked about it uh, a lot of times, you know, things coming out of this pandemic, uh, you know, really exposing where supply chains are going and, and, the, and the needs of complex supply chains globally. And so I, I think everyone's getting a front row seat to, uh, no matter what side of the aisle you're on, everyone really coming together as as humans and uh and helping one uh one another out is mm. exciting for me to follow and i think it's uh i know my twitter feed's been jammed with updates and opinions and angles and it's just really really exciting uh, that's my big takeaway is you know, it's miraculous love that i, I want to get uh letty you and mary kate and greg away but really quick um We've been talking about the noble mission when it comes to vaccine distribution for uh, weeks, if not months now. And we got some pushback over the weekend. Uh, I was told that, hey, supply chain folks are just making money. And while absolutely, you know, FedEx, yeah, that <laughs> they could be doing other things. Yeah. True. But here, here's the deal. While, you know, of course, that had to story, be Twitter, Scott. It was. It was. <laughs> but, you know, um, while FedEx and UPS and the story of the weekend working together and, and undoubtedly, right, they're charging for shipments just like any other transportation organization does. However, I was talking to Jenny Froome this morning and she was talking about, you know, getting access to Africa and, and some of the things that's going to have to take place, such as navigating across rivers with no bridges. And, you know, that's when this really become that the noble element of this really takes place because no one's gonna make a million bucks you know to do that they're gonna just find a way right and serve communities uh, across the, the the world and that's 
that in my book at least is what really why this is a noble mission um all right so letty let's go to you what what else are you tracking when it comes to this vaccine distribution yeah well i think kind of going off of what you guys have already acknowledged i really love that just for a country that's been so divided particularly over the year this is something that's really required union from a lot of different parties and partnerships and so totally agree this is going to be really just the the union of a lot of a lot of different people and and companies and so i'm excited to see that unfold i particularly have gone into a, a covid hole uh, of research learning more about the the software system that they are are using to track uh, the vaccines starting I guess this weekend and today particularly uh, apologies if I pronounce it wrong but I think it's uh, Tiberius I don't know if, if that's correct but um but I, uh, yeah it's it's it seems so interesting to me you know there's a lot of history there um, and and really just identifying the high risk population so that they can make sure that they're we're going to do this first round of distribution so effectively. And so I'm really interested to see uh, the successes and the learnings from that. I know you, you see a lot about uh, just since the summer, really, we've been practicing and practicing all different types of scenarios. Um, but I know they've said that failure is not an option. So I'm excited to see just the unique ways that will address um, the challenges that, that we could not foresee. Um, and specifically something that was super interesting to me with, with specifically the, the Tiberius system is just um, the way that they are a great example that uh, I think something I read about how they had a, a map of Alabama, for example, and how they were able to see kind of the trending cases by county. And then they were able to overlay just different vaccine scenarios of, in order to find the best distribution routes. And so that was super interesting to me, super um, unique, and I think just going to be awesome to see um, just the best distribution strategies that they can find. Yeah, well said, uh, Letty. Good stuff there. Mary-Kate, what are you tracking here? Yeah, that's awesome. I didn't realize all that about the system. I'll have to, I think all the nerd <laughs> left is ready to. I can send you a link. Yeah, please do. Um, I definitely, what stands out for, for me, and it's something that I think I've talked about on this podcast a few times, is I am so, I guess, taken aback by this partnership between, you know, you've got FedEx and UPS on shipping, Walmart, CVS, Walgreens, all on actually administering the drugs. Then you've got McKesson that's bringing in all the other materials and kits that are needed other than the vaccine. That's kind of something I didn't think about. Oh yeah, you're gonna need the needles. You're gonna need everything else. And I think all of us in our lifetime have worked on collaborative projects together. Um, I know the three of us, the three guests, Letty, Paul and I have worked on collaborative projects with each other. And the amount of time between one company and another company, even take GP, for example, working with another company to sign on a contract and get going on that scope of work it just is not as fast as anyone would like it to be for i think almost any company can say that right except um you know probably smaller and more nimble companies and certainly the united states federal government cannot ever really say that they move very quickly so i don't take for granted you know i focus a lot of my professional career on those smart partnerships and agile partnerships and I really am not taking this for granted that all of these corporations, all of them are huge, um, which means they are really um, great and they're great at making money. We know that, right? We know FedEx and UPS are great at making money, but the fact that they've kind of pushed aside other priorities to be able to get on these partnerships together um, with the government really leading that charge is probably not something I expected to move as fast as it has. And I know to us, it seems so slow. We were just talking about, you know, a couple months ago, we said, oh, it'll be if we just shut down for two weeks, right? But this has moved so, so quickly. And um, I'm just, I'm so impressed by that. And I think it's really laid this groundwork. You know, once you've got those partnerships established, they never really go away. So I think it's laid the groundwork for um, maybe some cool, new, innovative projects, especially as it relates to supply chain, to come around in the next few years. Well said. That spillover effect, I love that. You know, what would that collaboration lead to in non-pandemic uh, topics and, and, and problems and complexities? So I love that, Mary-Kate. Greg, what, what's some of the things you're tracking here as it relates to the vaccine distribution? Yeah, uh, I'm still struggling to get over your uh, Twitter fight. Um, I have a new tagline <laughs> Twitter for Twitter. Fight. <laughs> <laughs> new tagline for Twitter, the Dunning-Kruger effect on full display. 
where the angry and incompetent express their stupid opinions. <laughs> um, <laughs> trolls. They're called trolls. Yeah. Trolls. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, but th- I don't think that really gives does it justice anymore, does it? Uh, no. <laughs> but, um, you know, the thing that I think that is important, of course, is the, the coordination and collaboration and, dare I say it, the effectiveness of our government in mm-hmm. in facilitating this and funding it to enable and motivate the the the, um, medic, the vaccine producers to do something so fast. This is ordinarily a two to five year process mm-hmm. that we've done in nine ish months. Yeah. So uh, as everyone here has said, that is really impressive. I think the other thing is that eyes in the supply chain have been on how to do this from the very moment the even prospect of a vaccine came to the forefront and that we thought about things like not not just the impact on the supply chain for medical or vaccines, but the adjacent supply chains that will be impacted, the security, the threat of criminality, the, um, you know, the, the data and technology that is required to facilitate it and the fact that it's going to a multitude of governments. Right. Right. So. Um, We're thinking about how to get this to the last mile, even with the potential intervention of other governments that may or may not be highly motivated to do that. We've been talking about and and determining how to resolve that for months. And, you know, we saw it on full display. I don't know if you guys did see the trucks rolling out. Somebody took a video of the trucks. It's got to be the most popular thing on on Twitter. And I'm pretty sure that's what brought YouTube and Google down. Uh, last night. So, um, so it's, it's clearly big news and, and as it should be. And I I think it's, it is, um, you know, noble. It is of course profitable for, it's going to be profitable for somebody. I don't know who, but, but the fact is profit economics, as I say frequently, and we reinforce constantly is what drives people to do things that are good. That's right. Including eradicating uh, pandemic. So uh, lot, so much more to talk about. We're only scratching the surface, as we all know. But I want to circle back before we move on to the next story, to something that Paul said about, you know, everyone's got a front row seat, whether they like it or not, right? <laughs> if you're not in supply chain, you're breaking out your popcorn and you're enthralled with what's taking place, perhaps. But here's, you know, for any of those members of our audience that are, are tracking, just know this. There's going to be plenty of hurdles. This is not going to be perfect. The, the sheer complexities of, of from a temperature standpoint of of uh, of getting things from point A to point B to point Z and beyond and 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 limit the spoilage. I mean, it, it, we're talking about like next generation problem solving. So just, you know, don't don't hammer anybody when you hear the bad news. Uh, there's going to be there's going to be challenges to come. But the good news is. The greater story here and something that that should make you sleep well at night is, as we've all pointed out, and especially Mary Kate, just this unique collaboration is taking place across industry. So a lot of good news there. OK, yeah. is, it, is it safe? I appreciate everybody weighing in. I know I know, again, a huge story. It's tough to do it just in 10 minutes, but I think we called out some of the most critical things to track. All right. So moving right along, I want to say hello to a few folks. We've got a lot of comments here from uh, John is tuned in. Appreciate those comments, John, via LinkedIn. Great to have you here with us. Pat. Hello, Pat. Great to see you. Aaron Peterson's got some great news. He's making a choice on his first internship soon. Three great, three great companies he's choosing from. Uh, that is awesome news. Aaron, all the best. Please let us know uh, what your choice is. And, and once you're done, you're going to have to jo- join us and tell us some of your key learnings from the experience. Yeah, no um, doubt. In fact, Latia Thomas just graduated uh, recently. I don't know if you saw her picks, Scott. Loved but, it. Loved yeah. it. Uh, Morgan State University's got a uh, a blossoming uh, supply chain program there, uh, and yeah. great to meet Aaron and Latia. Uh, That's the uh, Morgan State crew we met out in uh, Arizona. Phoenix, yeah, yeah. My, my last trip pre-pandemic. No, Is great right? to be there. Um, glad to see them joining the workforce and, and changing the game. Agreed. Agreed. Great, great call out, uh, Paul. All right. So hello, Stephen, David. Hey, you can't have a live stream without David. And David also made a great point, uh, followed up to 
uh, MK's point about things kind of moving slow, he said it, it was not unique just to the U.S. government. And, and, and David Hale's from Canada. So I think all governments uh, move, can move slow at times. Yep. C Squared, who uh, holds down the fort for us on YouTube, is here with us, uh, ready for supply chain management nourishment, Greg. <laughs> Man, we got to deliver. Um, all right. So eggs are on, on the stove, man. <laughs> Hello to everybody. And we're going to circle back to some of the folks we couldn't get to, but let's move on to this next story here. Uh, and this is all about Mary Kate, um, packaging and sustainability and, and how these two maybe arch enemies are, are working together. Right? Absolutely. And I think, um, as I've gotten more into the operations at Georgia Pacific, I think there's, maybe some misunderstanding about how sustainable packaging and paper really is and really um, is striving to be. So I'm really excited to talk about this a little bit. Let's dive right in. Tell us more. Okay, so let me read you this one stat so I don't get it wrong, but this one kind of, I love stats like this. I think you guys do. But they um, there's a stat that says the first six months of this year, consumers spent 347 billion online in the United States and that's up 30% from last year's 266 billion. So that is pretty insane to think about up 30%. Um, I'm probably part of that 30% because <laughs> like many others, I've been shopping online exclusively and for everything. I mean, I never was an online grocery shopper, but now I'm starting to do that because I can pick it up. I don't forget things when I'm in the store. Um, I'm doing pretty much everything online and that's not different from what we're seeing. So while that's really exciting and it's kind of changing the way the retail space looks, um, Georgia Pacific in particular is working on our sustainable packaging. And so um, we're really seeing this as an opportunity for retailers and brands to not only tell their story on packaging and brands, but also um, kind of find new ways to be sustainable. So. If you all are familiar, I think a lot of us have received packages that are kind of that white material and they're padded yep. um, under it. Amazon sends a lot of those packages. So Georgia Pacific just opened up a new mill where we're just making padded paper ma mailers that can be completely recyclable. So this is gonna have huge impact when you think about this online space and we're all getting our packages either in boxes, those white mailers, or now you're seeing some of these brown recyclable mailers. And you know, a lot are predicting that this online kind of trend is not going to go away because of the convenience. Like I just said, you know, I'm probably not going to stop shopping for groceries online, even though I never did that before. So we're looking at that, and we're finding out that the more and more we work with this, uh, we realize that our consumers are also paying attention. So a lot of our customers at GP are working with us to make sure that they're sustainable, not only because it's a good thing for the earth, but they know um, that their consumers are paying attention, which is just a really cool trend to see. Great point there. And, and absolutely more and more by the day, more mm -hmm. consumers are demanding uh, more sustainable, more action and bottom line results being made in sustainability initiatives. So great point there, MK. Um, Paul, you and Letty weigh in here. What what some of the um, What's some of the, the, the conversations you're hearing out in the industry as it relates to packaging or sustainability? Yeah, we have a handful of customers that we work with in the packaging industry. Um, in addition to Georgia Pacific, I think it's, you know, to Mary Kate's point, not only all of us that were kind of trending that way anyway, but this huge additional demographic of people you that wouldn't have gotten into it unless forced to uh, through a pandemic has opened up a lot of opportunities for innovation in packaging. Uh, I think I just saw over the over the weekend my first my first few Amazon packages with advertising on them. Yep. Um, so there's going to be I think a lot more of that. You know, wherever there's packages on front steps, there's going to be eyeballs and uh, opportunities to build awareness. So uh, uh, hmm. that's really exciting. Um, and and think that it's you know not going to slow down anytime soon right. um so a, a, a heightened awareness and it kind of tails over from our um covid 19 vaccine discussion you know front row seat but also this elevated awareness and urgency on supply chain innovation you know we see it every day as we talk about it and, and live it 
Right. Um, but I think everyone's exposure to that is pretty exciting and, and where that's going to continue to go. And, um, you know, supply chain entering in the renaissance we talked about, I think, eight, yeah. eight months ago. Right. Uh, it's going to it's not going to slow down. Vaccine aside, you know, online shopping aside, just uh, it's going to be a really fun time over the next uh, few years here. Excellent. Yep. Great point. A couple quick comments here. Marie says consumers want sustainability, but they usually don't want to pay for it themselves. Great comment there from Marie. Mm -hmm. T squared says uh, P and G's 2020 sustainability initiative may be under scrutiny given its reduction goals on packaging and paper usage. They um, being not aggressive enough, I think is right the there. One, and, and, and quick comment. I think packaging has got such a tough, it's such a complex business mm -hmm. because as we all know, packaging sells products right and it's designed to get that eye and, and get you to pick yeah. it up off the shelf and put it yeah. in the in the cart on the flip side as we look to streamline all of that and and use less material and or use material that that um is has recycling options and and better end of usage options you've got some constraints there so it, it's uh it's a terribly complex uh part of the business greg what are you um what's what's a quick takeaway here for you yeah i i echo what marie says you know and until we're willing to pay for it th these companies can do whatever they want uh, but it but as i said before everything come back comes back to economics right yep. we want to do good as consumers every one of us does every one of us every single day makes a decision that supports un a lack of sustainability mm -hmm. conflict minerals slavery we do that all the time we don't even know it i mean right. that's part of the problem so you know, we have to create an awareness there. And frankly, we have to make it economically sensible because the truth is people don't, they don't spend right. their disposable income on saving the planet or other people unless they do it as part of a, a specific like philanthropic initiative. So when you're buying product, you don't want to have to think about that. Yep. Right so that, that's a challenge that has been in the industry forever, right? Claudia addresses that in this discussion here. And you know, that's that's part of the issue is we don't see the environmental damage in our pocketbook. If we did, that would change things, right? Excellent. If there was an actual cost. Yeah, I, I love that. Just to quickly add a note to that, I love that call out about the economics of it. And, you know, for GP, luckily, we're working in a space with mostly renewable resources. And we um, we have this really cool initiative where we'll only source trees from forests and places that are replenishing. So we with confidence say we can for every tree that we take in, which I can't even express to you how many truckloads are coming in each day. Um, if right. you've ever been to a GP mill, you just see them go and pass you. But for every tree that we buy or purchase, we know that we're planting one to three more. Um, and so we're only purchasing trees from forests that are sustainable and making sure that they're um, keeping up with their sustainability efforts that we grade them on. So I really like that call out on the economics piece because I think that's just the reality of it too. Love yeah. that. Love we that. have to be managed. Uh, really quick for our for our listeners that may be catching us on the audio replay, let me just share the, the, the point uh, that Greg and Mary Kate are alluding to. Claudia Fried says consumers are already paying for sustainable innovations, whether they see the cost breakdown or not. If not in the pocketbook, in the environmental damage so might as well give a price uh great point there claudia mm -hmm. greg you're going to make one more point well i i can i can vouch for that if you've ever driven through south georgia they're almost all georgia pacific forests down yep. there and you can watch little kids try to figure out as you're driving by where the rows line how the rows line up to the road right yeah yep. those forests are continually replenished and actively mm -hmm. so and and the truth is a lot of that ground was not forest before so right. yep. it's actually a net contribution to yeah right? they have this really cool study where the volume of trees in the southeast is actually 50 percent fuller now than it was in the 1970s so it's love that it's i think wow. there's this misconception of how much work has been put into this for so long that it's a it's a i mean there's always room for improvement i'm sure but it's a really um i think in some ways a well-oiled machine it right. has to problem be, right? is soybeans everyone <laughs> Stop eating soy. Soy is the largest contributor to deforestation on the really? planet. Wow. Do that. We're going to have to dive in deeper yeah. on that on that topic, Greg. Hey, really quick from the audience. AA is back with us from the Air Capital 
of the world, Wichita, Kansas. He says, Marie Hurst, that's why innovation be became so important. Also, it gives marketing a competitive edge to innovators. Good point there. Wayne Donnelly says, sustainable packaging is great, but we need to close the loop on the availability of recycling programs. Amen. That's huge. Yeah, no, I was thinking the exact same thing. It was a comment I was going to interject um, with is making, you know, again, municipalities and consumers and enterprises coming together to make sure, I mean, my recycling bin is overflowing every week, you know, halfway through the week now. And it's, it's more and more difficult to, to get all of the recyclable and sustainable packaging. Yeah. Back, in the, uh, yeah. You know, back in the circular economy there. So I think it's going to be a, a challenge to your point, Greg, this challenge of, you know, we can do both, right? We can be sustainable without it, you know, grossly affecting the cost of things and, yep. you know, everyone coming together and getting on board there. You would like to think that uh, off the backs of what we're doing with the COVID-19 vaccine that we can achieve both of those things, right? So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. everyone is, a, is at least an accidental environmentalist. Think back to your your parents and grandparents and great grandparents right. who said, turn off the light when you leave the room. <laughs> yeah, I mean, absolutely. And, and why did they say that? Be not because they necessarily love the environment, though my great grandparents were huge outdoors people, but because yeah. they paid for the electricity yeah. that it took to, to fire those lights. So, right. well, hey, I spend three hours every day, it feels like just turning lights off. But, <laughs> but hey, we've got one person for Greg, Greg White's feature blockbuster on the soy industry. We've got a backer right here already in T-squared from uh, via YouTube, Greg. So we're, we're going to have to act on that and make that happen. Sure. Um, all right. So let's move right along. So we've got a big topic here for uh, the next uh, article we're going to dive into. And that's really for, from some research that Letty and Paul and the Verison team have been leading here in recent months. And let's talk a lot more about this. So, um, Paul, for starters, before we dive into the state of supply chain inventory management study for 2020, in a real small nutshell, what, what does Verison do? And then let's talk about some of the key findings here. Well, how much time you got? No. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, so, yeah, we are a uh, supply chain intelligence company. We're based here in Atlanta. We help large organizations. It's less really a lot of manufacturing, energy uh, understand the materials that they're using to run their operations and produce their products. So um, we help uh, understand data that lives in uh, various systems of record across an organization and can help fuel a lot of the things that we're talking about today, you know, uh, being able to trust that they have inventory without grossly overstocking and disposing of uh, a lot of excess and waste, reducing that, fueling sustainability goals uh, you know, across the organization, but while being profitable, it's, again, it's you can do both, right? right. With, when, um, when presented with the right information in a scalable way. So we, we help organizations you know, like Georgia Pacific, like AB InBev, you know, across various verticals, um, achieve those goals and, and you know, uh, do it quickly uh, laying a foundation that they can uh, scale across their entire supply chains. Love that. And and, I, and and before we leave here today, I want to talk about the material truth. I love this yeah. uh, this messaging. It, it, it makes me think of like a, a, a heavyweight fight, right? And yeah. we've got material truth in this corner. We've got bad data, but we'll talk more about that. <laughs> <Let's>, <laughs> hey, what can I say? We were just talking. Oh, about I love it. Mike Tyson last week. Bad, um, bad data is just talking. He's like Ivan Drago, <laughs> just pain, pain. <laughs> Rocky, <laughs> Rocky Four, I will break you. I will break right. you. All right. So Letty and Paul, this has been some exhaustive research, and I know that there's a slew of key takeaways, but there's a, there's a couple we want to focus on here today. Is that right? And let it, we hadn't heard from you here lately. Let, let's let's go with you first here. What what's one of the key takeaways from this research? Yeah, so just a little bit of quick background. This survey was really uh, targeted to an audience of uh, individuals that were involved in inventory and materials management. So just have that in mind as we uh, share some of these key highlights. But I think one of my favorite 
uh, stats that we pulled from that survey is uh, that a majority of the respondents, actually 55% of the respondents, rated their supply chain maturity levels as high or highest. But when we asked them about their preparedness for the coronavirus and its impact, only 10% of them said they felt prepared or even remotely were prepared. And so I found that uh, extremely insightful to just learn that with feeling that your supply chain was mature, no one was really prepared for the impact and the challenges experienced because of the COVID pandemic. Yeah, well stated there, Letty. Um, Paul, from where you sit, uh, what's been a key takeaway or two from, from all of this data? Yeah, I think it, you know we're continuously you know tr trying to get out to uh, business leaders across operations, supply chain, procurement. You know, really trying to understand what uh, what immediate actions they're looking to take, and also trying to you know drive that paradigm shift of what's possible now um, outside of you know traditional. Uh, challenges. So, you know, a big part of what we're doing um, is around material truth, changing the way supply chains work and doing it in a, in a much different way um, that, that can show um, that things are possible, you know, to get better while, uh, while being sustainable, while driving, you know, driving down costs and driving out costs. Um, and, really have been inspired by the response of executives uh, throughout this year, you know, both from a heightened awareness uh, of having to react, but also um, combining that with the desire to react and, uh, and, and be proactive uh, to take the approaches that they need um, to get where they want to get where they're uh, heading overall. You know, Paul, as I was digesting, Paul and Letty, as I was digesting this report, uh, I came across one key takeaway that probably won't surprise any of us, and that is Excel spreadsheets still <laughs> dominate global supply chains, right? Uh, can yeah. we all speak to that a, a little bit? Yeah. yeah I think, so, uh, oh, go ahead, Letty. Go ahead. No, <laughs> I was just going to say, I, I know I was going to try to squeeze that in there before we change subjects because it, it feels so redundant to say, I mean, I can't even believe it's 2020 and or rounding out 2020. And we're still talking about Excel spreadsheets. It's just crazy to see so many of global companies are just so handcuffed to these Excel, Excel spreadsheets. And they're just these mundane, repetitive tasks that um, that, that we are far more advanced. And as a software uh, solution provider, it, it definitely pained me to read that, that stat and that uh, highlight from the survey. <laughs> there's hope though. I think there's, there's hope. With, with Excel, you know, people feel they have more control and being able to manipulate data and you know, put their opinion on things. Um, we've in part developed our user interface to help give Again, you can have it both ways. You can have a voice and have control and transparency on things without having to consistently analyze things outside of a system of record. Um, so as that transition goes, you know, I think that uh, and generational shifts, I think, will also help a lot with that. Agreed. All right. So to our audience, we can you can download this report to be the link we've got in the show notes. Uh, it's chock full of great information, great agnostic information about uh, what executives are are thinking about and what they're doing. Uh, and inventory management obviously has been a huge pain point here in 2020. So y'all check that out. Uh, and we've already had a few folks that have. Uh, Gary Smith says he's just downloaded a report. He's looking forward to reading it. Gary, we'd love to get your feedback right, Gary. from what you see. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Ali. Um, you're asking about the link. The link is in the show notes. So if you're on LinkedIn, if you go to the, uh, the notes we've got just below the video viewer, you'll be able to click on that, submit your information and get it. In. And by the way, Ali, great to have you here with us. And going back, so David, uh, David says that the uh, the material truth looks like bad data. Bad data. <laughs> right. We'll put it on pay-per-view. Uh, so, <laughs> hey, for <laughs> practitioners, I might sell some tickets. I don't know. It's a good it. way to raise money. That's right. There you go. And Pierre says, Excel, like having a carpenter limited to just a hammer. That's one of our. <laughs> That's great. All right. So uh, let's move. Greg, I want to get you to, to weigh in on, on some of what you hear. Before we move on to the next story, what, you know, we're hearing, this is like a refrain. 
with some of what we hear. But what what did you read in this research? Well, I think you know one of the things we have to recognize is that P Paul and his team at Verison they deal with manufacturers and all due respect to GP Mary Kate manufacturers are pretty sloppy in their supply chain manu uh, management because they make such huge margins. Mm -hmm. So they haven't had to be tremendously um, tremendously precise like distributors and retailers have. And and they're also highly acquisitive. So, you know, when you look at the data from a company, if we're talking about paint, right? This company calls it a bucket, this company calls it a pail, and this company calls it a can, and it's, it's, it's exactly the same product. But we triplicate the inventory because we don't know that they are essentially the same product. And, and that creates a tremendous amount of waste in the supply chain, and that waste, of course, impacts sustainability. So that's something we've gotta be very, very aware of. And, and that impact, I mean, and we've seen it at Veris and the impact that um, they can have it is dramatic and immediate and um, and companies are are making big, big changes. You know, at Blue Ridge, we did a similar thing in the distribution and retail, not with the data, but with the optimizing the inventories. So I'm familiar with the impact that this can have. And if there's that much waste at retail and distribution and they are much less acquisitive and particularly this acquisitive strategy leads to that duplication and triplication of inventory. And that is huge, a huge impact on the bottom line of these companies and on sustainability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're having uh, conversations with uh, Gartner analyst and, you know, the shift, this was 12 months ago, but the shift from these things being projects and things that you look at occasionally, you know, Right. Expectations of the consumer. Yeah. Everything is uh, compounding here. Uh, you know, all of us are going to go, well, if they can distribute this vaccine so quickly, why can't I get things in one day instead of two? Yeah. Right? So it's going to be, there's going to be all these expectations. And, and, you know, they think this big transition that we've seen in supply chain is the move away from projects to, you know, to technologies and systems that um, create a living, breathing um, solution around data and what we call the byproducts of data. And uh, and it's exciting to work and, and see see the results happen so quickly. Mm -hmm. Scott, I think you're muted. Oh, here we go. <laughs> ah, you're just I heard, I heard sure we're back to Zoom. <laughs> I heard Amanda from around the corner. Scott, you're muted. Um, <laughs> but hey, um, fast moving conversation for sure. So David says back to Excel, that's the problem with it, right? You're able to manipulate too much. You got to get the fingers out of the pies. I love that mm -hmm. comment. Well, and Paul said, you know, generationally th that will start to go away that I have to own this, um, dynamic is, is rapidly now evaporating in supply chain yeah. yep. that if the tech can do it for me, it should, that is a much, much more healthy, uh, point of view. Excellent point. Claudia says, uh, COVID killed inertia in 2020. Leaders cannot sit and wait to see what happens or keep doing what they used to be doing up until now. Great point there, Claudia. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Gary says, unfortunately, because of severe budget restrictions, we in government are stuck with resorting to Excel and software that is at least a generation old. That's a great point, Gary. That's an excellent point. Um, I think a, the cloud can change that. I yeah. think the cloud and and software as a service can can change that even for governments. One, it's not a capital line item technically. So if you're a good manager of your budget, then it doesn't require a capital expenditure effort. And two, the cost is much, much lower. Democratization works for democracies as well. Mm. Excellent point. Mm -hmm. AJ says, I wonder if the respondents mentioned if they increase their buffer inventory now, and if so, is it going to be temporary or more strategic? Letty, Paul, you want to, any commentary there? Yeah, I think that um, you're going to see a lot of that on the retail, you know, finished goods side of things so that uh, you can fulfill service levels, right? And it's going to, there will be a bit of that based on what we, we we refer to as this uh, subjective reliability, right? Um, I feel like I have enough, even though the data is not 
not really um, driving that. So I think there will be just to feel reliable, feel that, you know, service and Sigma levels can be hit, whether it's indirect materials, direct materials or finished goods. Um, but that, uh, you know, hopefully as everyone gets over this, over the hump and, and can begin planning and becoming more predictive, prescriptive. And even if you miss a target that you're learning from it to, you know, improve the next uh, recommendation, um, I think that we'll, we'll see it go back to, you know, not grossly overstocking. Yep. Well, so that, that research clearly generated a lot of discussion. Again, folks, you can download that report uh, via the, the link in the show notes, and we'd encourage you to do so. A lot of, a lot of great learnings there. All right, moving right along. Uh, story number four, we're talking, you know, there's not been, I guess there's been a few retail winners, but there's been a lot more retail losers. But Best Buy is one of the folks that's done really well in the pandemic. Uh, and there's a great story that came out about shrinking sales floor space, a strategy that Best Buy is using more and more. So let, let's start with you. Tell us a lot more about this. Yeah. So this is super interesting. I think um, Best Buy has been, I feel like, more of a proactive um, company over the years. I mean, even if you think about six, seven years ago, they were really ahead of the rise of showrooming. And um, <clears throat> you see that proactiveness again here. They are trialing kind of a, a shrunken uh, uh, sales floor. I think they trailed it up in Minneapolis and they cut their sales floor in half to make room for a fulfillment center. And so they decided to really just keep the fast moving SKUs on the floor so that they could really have that additional space to fill those uh, online orders, the ship from store orders, the uh, customer pickup orders. And so this has been really ex interesting because like you said, not a lot of people have explored this space. Um, but but as they're going, they're really trying different models. I think I read something about how one 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 trial, one model had more room for the geek squad, and then one had a bigger, uh, more square footage for the electronics section. So they're really trying to uh, trial out a, a lot of different layouts and models to see really where the success lies. Um, and I also read that uh, they're trying kind of a similar concept with with malls. I mean, uh, I've heard a lot, especially over this year, how malls are really uh, dead as we know them. That's really 2020 has brought the death of, of the, the traditional mall. And so I know a lot of real estate companies are really trying out different models to um, put last mile delivery um, and order fulfillment centers uh, in, in the brick and mortar stores that aren't able to keep their leases this year. Letty, great point. And you know what? Even moving forward, I saw I saw a study in, in, in the last week or two where it was surveying thousands of uh, traditional mall consumers and asking them, you know, after even after the pandemic, are they willing to return to shopping in malls? And the percentage of folks that said they weren't going back and shopping that way was was much higher than you might expect. So malls certainly have their their work cut out for them. Greg, I know you're you're itching to weigh in. I'll get you and MK to weigh in on, on the, the amazing shrinking, disappearing uh, sales floor space. Two words, service, merchandise. <laughs> Most of the people listening and probably participating in this panel don't even know what service merchandise is, but right. that was their model, was fulfillment from the store with just a showroom in the front of the store where you tried and selected your bicycle or whatever the product was and then you purchased it and it either came out on a conveyor or was shipped to you later to your home. So that is the first thing. If you're, if you're attempting this, then I would look back at the, at that model and evaluate the success and failures of that model. The model itself was not the failure. The management of service merchandise was a failure. The other thing is, and this is such a throwback Letty, because um, I, Never, ever, this is this is the thing I want to say, start with, never, ever count Best Buy out. Because when I started doing business with Best Buy in 1996, they were coming out of bankruptcy. They had opened precisely two stores the previous year, and they planned to open 256 the year that, that, that we started working with them. We created $40 billion in, in inventory reduction for that, and ca in capital, not inventory reduction, but in capital for that company to the extent that we had a lawsuit with their consulting firm at the time over who actually created the value because the <laughs> consulting firm had a, we get a portion of whatever we help, we contribute to. So 
but but then showrooming hit them right i mean and that and a lot happened in the meantime but then um big box stores kind of fell out of favor some big box in other industries went away then show showrooming hit them as people started buying electronics online they adapted to that as you said letty and now they're adapting again this is a super resilient organization so um you know i'm not a not the hugest best buy fan in fact the story i tell about how i started solving the e-commerce puzzle for retailers um is about how my wife was in a best buy store buying a product for me online in the store when best buy did not have the product in stock at the time it's clear that they've gotten that message and they're they're rebounding there so Greg, i hope I, I, I bet you are a tough person to buy gifts for <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I only have a gift that I want every year, and I guarantee you, my wife and my children can tell you precisely what that is. <laughs> well, we're, we're out to have them on. Uh, all right, so for the sake of moving, I'm gonna move right along. I'm gonna read a couple comments here, and MK, I know you're gonna lead off with our anti fragile supply chain. So hang on one second here. I want to add um, so BKC is is tuned in via YouTube, uh, and they say very proactive and successful here in ATL. In, in Atlanta here, Best, Best Buy shares leasing with Aldi. I didn't know that. In-store fulfillment sounds like a great value prop. Agreed, agreed. Uh, Gary mentioned what goes around comes around, the return of service merchandise and Elman's models. That's a new one for me. Yeah, Best Products too, I believe, was another one that did a similar model. Really? Pierre says, uh, with Best Buy reducing the size of the retail floor, we will see floor inventory go away. Yes, service merchandise. Uh, Pratik, great to have you here. I want to say hello. Thanks for tuning in via LinkedIn. Jeff says, planogrammed inventory on the sales floor does not always merchandising strategy make. Best Buy proves this point. Great point there, Jeff. AA loves the zooming in feature. Hey, we'll <laughs> mess around with production, AA. Uh, thanks for noticing. I really appreciate that. Um, and then let's see here. I've got one more comment I wanted to read here. We've got one LinkedIn user that I'm not sure who that is. So Clay, uh, Amanda or Clay, if you could let me know, they've got some great comments here. Uh, and then finally, Amanda says, I remember shopping for Christmas gifts for my mom with my dad at service merchandise. At? Who would have thunk? I thought you just went through the catalog and then walked in the store to order and pick it up. I didn't know. Oh, by the way, catalogs are what they had before the internet. <laughs> yeah, before they were e-catalogs. Yes. Yeah. Well, service, clearly, service merchandise had a ton of fans. Every time we bring that analogy up, Greg, there's a bunch of comments. I'm stunned at how many people remember it. I mean, we were just kids when it went belly up. But, man, if you ever went in the store, I mean, you, re you remember it. I remember because I got a bicycle there once as a kid. So uh, let's move right along. Uh, clearly, Best Buy is turning a lot of heads with that strategy. We'll have to bring them back on, maybe even get someone from Best Buy to talk more about what they're seeing. Um, but here in story number five, we're talking about this notion of creating anti-fragile supply chains. I love that. After hearing the word resilient a million times, sometimes yeah. with nothing behind it, this, this term anti-fragile supply chains, love that. So let's flip the script here. Mary Kate, I'd love for you to weigh in. When you hear that word, what comes to mind? And then Paul, yeah. and, Paul and Mary Kate, uh, Paul and Letty will, will dive in with you. But MK, what do you, what do you hear? Love this article too. And um, I, the word that stuck out to me when I was reading this was evolving. And so a lot of times I think we use resilient and it just means get up and go back and do it the same way and just work harder, which is the appropriate response sometimes. But when you think about anti-fragile, you think about how you're gonna evolve and change what you do, which is really um, kind of inspiring and aligns a lot with what we call at Coke, which um, GP is owned by Coke. So we call that principal entrepreneurship. So a few weeks ago, this article also made me think about Coke was named um, the largest privately held company in the United States, which is really exciting, but my background has been mostly in startups. And so, you know, I thought about how that can be a little bit scary too, but making sure that we have this principled entrepreneurship mindset and we continue to evolve is super important. And then the second piece that I think stuck out to me and that is also super important to a company like GP and Coke is that we need to have partnerships with companies like Verison 
that um, do evolve and make us think differently and work differently. So if we can keep the mindset of principled entrepreneurship and then work with companies that are constantly evolving like Verison, I think um, we'll be on a good path. That's an excellent point, uh, Mary Kate. And, and, you know, whether it was an earlier episode with you or Paul or maybe even Daryl Lou, Greg, we were talking about how a lot of the larger companies are getting more comfortable and, and they're finding more successful ways of working with more startups and early stage companies. And that's been a wonderful thing to see yeah. here in recent years. Um, all right. So, Paul and Letty, and, and pa Paul, we'll start with you. Tell us more about this and creating anti-fragile supply chains and what maybe in particular stood out in this article in your mind. Yeah, it's something we see all the time. I think you were you had posted something about it, Greg, last week in uh, one of your tequila sunrise uh, promos with this uh, aspect of, you know, preparing your supply chain to be agile enough that you, you know, don't open yourself up to fragility, you know, you're, that you're, you're not, right. you're prepared enough with a foundation that you can be agile, sometimes miss, but learn quickly and adjust quickly is better than being perfectly predictive. Cause that's again, like trying as our uh, CRO Jeff Wilson would say is like trying to achieve world peace. So, mm -hmm. you, you know, that's the biggest thing that sticks out is, you know, preparing, yourself through technology and you know looking at problems differently um that's the key point you know this kind of mind shift a little bit um that doesn't take a project that's going to last two to three years to achieve it because that's way way too slow with how quickly um the target moves even outside a pandemic from a business perspective excellent point yeah. Paul. greg, greg yeah. that Something you've touched on a thousand times about folks don't have time for that traditional two or three year project when it comes to especially technology transformation and implementation, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, first of all, that the, those e even the biggest of players recognize that the the, um, the two to seven to ten year implementation is going the way of the one. We heard about it at Sapphire, right? SAP even is trying to create much much more concise imp uh, implementation models. Yep. And to and to Paul's point, I mean, John Sicard, right? He calls it this insane obsession with accuracy to the exclusion of agility and responsiveness in the supply chain. And instead of acknowledging and trying to and trying to adapt when something does go wrong and is unpredictable, we try to predict the unpredictable. And that's essentially what he's saying there. And and I think that is important. It's important for us to recognize that agility and responsiveness is a key part of the supply chain. Great point. Because there will always be a disruption, as you know, we've heard 10,000 times this year. Uh, yeah, according to Accenture, once one major, disrupt, major disruption like the pandemic every 3.7 years, according to some, some of the recent research. Yeah, I don't believe that, but we'll see a lot of <laughs> quite this. I mean, we'll never, we will never see a disruption. Knock on wood this ever again because it wasn't natural right it was it was the even the pandemic didn't cause this disruption we caused it to ourselves mm -hmm. i'm just reporting the numbers just i'm just uh <laughs> reporting the yeah, no 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 i i know i'm so I'm, well we don't hey. believe it, scott <laughs> <laughs> i'm the pony express just delivering <laughs> letters folks that's all all right so lady i'm gonna get you to weigh in here but really quick yeah. uh, a couple of comments uh jeffrey miller says durable hardened supply chains. John Perry says, build strategic flexibility into your supply chain. That is a great term right there. Agreed. Strategic flexibility, strategic agility. I like that. Antonio says, these things all go back to assurance of supply planning and having redundancies to make sure you do not have disruptions to your organization. Great point there. All right. Mm -hmm. So, Letty, we're talking about this article four strategy shifts toward building an anti-fragile supply chain from that uh, came to us from supply chain brain. What's what was one of your key takeaways? Well, I just I love this anti-fragility concept to harp on it a little bit more. Um, I really loved what it talked about um, as far as really not just resisting the disruption or avoiding it, but really to benefit from it. I think that's really the game changer 
um, that, that can differentiate yourself in the market. And uh, I love what it mentioned about uh, Albert Einstein saying, you can't solve a problem with the same kind of thinking that created it. And in order to achieve those anti-fragile supply chains, you really have to think about your supply chain differently. And you have to think about the ways that you want to make your supply chain work. And um, it's really getting that diversity of perspective and partnering with uh, different suppliers and having those valuable partnerships that really um, bring that diversity of perspective to think about things differently um, to help you achieve that. Well said. So mm -hmm. much goodness in what you just shared there, Letty. Um, really quick, I've gotten a couple texts, Letty. Folks are wanting to know what is behind you out your window. Where are you at? <laughs> it's not I'm snow, in, even though it kind of yeah. looks like. Oh, does it look like snow? Yeah, no, uh, I'm just in good old Atlanta, Tech Square, Midtown. <laughs> Tech Square, happening place. Yes. Good stuff. Yes. All right, so so much good stuff here. Uh, David says, shoot that messenger. <laughs> yeah, Scott, that wasn't intended for you. Oh, I'm, I, <laughs> hey, look, I'm, I'm only messing with you. Um, Sidget, maybe I'm, I might mispronounce that. I'm sorry if I am. Uh, agility and responsibility. What about the fact in supply chain? And T Square makes a similar comment, and I want y'all to weigh in on this if you'd like. Too much focus on accuracy and or analysis will lead to stagnation and eventually paralysis. Even as a student, this bears out. So, uh, Greg, I think we were just talking about that. Uh, um, Sheer the the, the uh, incredible attention paid to accuracy. I can't believe, I can't remember exactly how you put Same it. Obsession with accuracy. There we go. So <laughs> yes, speak to, speak Scott, to, and he was adamant about that. So <laughs> we'll speak to T squared's point a little bit. What at what point um, can you pursue that while balancing that that cliche paralysis by analysis? What's your quick take there? I, well, it's very foundational for me. You have to acknowledge outliers. Really what you can predict is what's predictable. And I know that sounds, um, that sounds very Mike Tomlin. I want people to do the essential things essentially. Um, yeah, yeah. But um, really what you can predict is predictable. That's why you have to prepare with agility for that which is not predictable or that which is what we traditionally call in forecasting an outlier, mm. right? If it is unlikely to happen or it's an outlier in terms of statistical prob probability, then you can try to capture that in the forecast, but you also have to provision for that in terms of agility and responsiveness. That's what the successful solutions have always done. Uh, Paul, any, any additional commentary there? No, that's it. Just uh, that's what material truth's all about. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> I want some, I want some, uh, uh, boxing gloves to hang in in the studio with material like truth that. on it so let's I was get thinking more like cage match <laughs> <laughs> um well all right like Undertaker, so hogan something like that. <laughs> we're That's at perfect. 102 so we are a couple minutes over uh, our allotted time but there's been so much we've been tackling here today and and we've had so many great comments as well from our audience that always brings it and by the way hello samson uh, from Nigeria via LinkedIn. Great to have you here with us. Uh, Scott says, I remember doing automated manifests from service merchandises, sales spreadsheet orders in Excel. Okay, so let's think about how long ago service merchandise went out of business. I think it was right. the 80s, was just it? to give you an idea. They were using spreadsheets back then. I think it's time, people. <laughs> time. All right. Well, um, so much good stuff. Uh, and oh, by the way, we got to give a shout out to, to Fred Tolbert, who is the um, Greg. What did you deem Fred? Fred is a doc holiday of supply chain. <laughs> if you want a hot take and if you want to know what is who uh, hooey in supply chain, hey, reach out to, to Fred. Uh, he's With always an amazing. Great. I mean, amazing Southern accent. I love yes. it. it. It is like watching Doc Holiday talk supply chain. He will be your Huckleberry. All right, <laughs> let's, go around, let's go around the panel here uh, and make sure folks can connect with Mary Kate and Letty and Paul. Um, such a, I wish we had a couple more hours to dive a little deeper in, in the, some of these things we've talked about here today. But Paul, let's start with you. How can folks connect with you and Verison? Yeah, so uh, Verison.com, uh, at Verison underscore AI and all the so, uh, social channels. And then, uh, reach me on email, paul.noble at verison.com. Look forward awesome. to hearing from you all. Awesome. And Letty, how about you? 
Yep, it's uh, Letty Barrett on LinkedIn. I'm pretty active on there. Uh, and then, yeah, like Paul said, all of our social channels for Verison. Well, then I'm not let y'all get away just that easily because you've got a webinar this week. And I think we've got, Amanda, you may have the link if you could drop in the comments. So really quick in a very small acorn nutshell, Letty, Paul, what, what's the webinar about? Yeah, so we'll be having a webinar this Wednesday at two o'clock. We would love to see you guys there. We're going to go, go into just a quick overview about Verison and what we do with our customers. And we'll go into a product demo uh, and really give you guys a hands-on experience about what it feels like to be a, a customer of Verison. Outstanding. Really appreciate that. Yeah, Letty. We, do oh. these, uh, we do these monthly. So if you can't make it, you can always get the recording and uh, or join us next month. Perfect. Really Ton appreciate of knowledge in those. Agreed. All right, so Mary Kate, uh, first off, I need your autograph because uh, founder of National Supply Chain Day is a title that uh, is a feat that not many can pull off. So great to have you back. It's, it feels like it's been forever, but I uh, love to, to catch up with you and, and hear all the great things you're doing out in industry. How can folks connect with you? Yeah, so uh, MKLove2 on Twitter or Mary Kate that Love, spelled just like you think it is, at gapac.com is my email. Fantastic. And LinkedIn too. Can't forget LinkedIn. That's right. Connect on LinkedIn. I think we've got uh, your LinkedIn profile on the show notes along with Letty and Paul. Greg, what a great conversation we've had. We knew what we were in store for today, uh, yeah. but outstanding conversation. huh? Yeah. I mean, first of all, what great topics. What a great day to be discussing these topics, right? We are rolling with the vaccine and and to examine what that means for the supply chain, I think is really, really important. And of course, all of this, uh, this is the thing that people need to recognize about supply chain. And that is that even though this huge news happened, and this is probably all most of the world has their eyes on right now, we still in supply chain have our eyes on sustainability and packaging and all alt resiliency and anti-fragility and all of these things and the changes that continue to evolve in supply chain regardless of what else is going on yeah that's a great call out uh greg that's a great call out because uh, global supply chains don't stop just because there is a, a new noble mission and a, and a massive vaccine that the world is demanding everything else has got to keep going everything else i mean mary kate mentioned groceries and so many folks are getting you know groceries via e-commerce or or just traditional, you know, the shelves still got to stay full. It, mm -hmm. It's amazing. Just, I mean, despite the challenges or as uh, someone famous put it, the warts and all, right. There's plenty of opportunity for improvement in supply chain. The sheer resilience that uh, using that buzzword, the sheer, the sheer resilience that is already baked into global supply chain. The fact we've got stuff at our fingertips around the corner at your, your grocery store while uh, supply chains are tackling the vaccine uh, distribution. Uh, it, it's really it's, n it's no nothing shorter than amazing. <laughs> nothing short of amazing. Is what I'm yeah. trying to say. Yes. So, and by the way, Mary Kate, send that parking ticket over to supply chain <laughs> now. We're gonna pick that thing up. Not a problem. <laughs> out there, Pierre. But always a pleasure. You've expensed that to somebody by now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll have to tell you about how many tickets I got. Letty knows in a very short. <laughs> way, so. well, then, at yeah. some point, it becomes your fault. Yeah, yeah, it 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 was. <laughs> uh, even uh, Greg Bob Bova was tuned in with us here. At, Holy uh, mackerel! Beach Mobile, great to have you big here, show Bob. Bob. Absolutely. Um, all right, Big Show Bob. That's right, nickname. Um, so big thanks to Paul Noble, founder and CEO at Verison, Letty Barrett, senior business analyst, also with Verison. Uh, great job. Love to see uh, uh, Verison's on the move and, and really love to see what you are doing to transform industry. And of course, our dear friend, Mary Kate Love, operations business integration lead from Georgia Pacific and founder of National Supply Chain Day. <laughs> Pleasure to have all three of you with us here today. Greg, we're going to sign off. The swoosh machine is broken. This, we're gonna we got to put it in the shop so, so we're, we're all gonna, going off at once that's right so everybody at once we didn't do we didn't do our um we didn't do our uh survey on the, the video wave, wave. wave. I think we're all in favor of the wave here are we not yeah. we can do the wave instead of the swoosh just before we're gonna bring that poll back on thursday's uh live stream uh really Pulse audience to get our research going like the Verison team. Uh, but before we sign off, 
hey, we're going to challenge our audience like we challenge our team every single day. Do good, give forward, and be the change that's needed. And on that note, we'll see you next time here. Go Browns. Browns. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Bye. Bye.